Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Today, we have an interview with Tyler Dolly on sustainable, regenerative agriculture and farming practices and how to raise healthy chickens. Um, most of us have seen some of these horrible vegan documentaries that show factory farm chickens being raised in horrible conditions, in cramped cages, all crowded together, given antibiotics, given feed with arsenic and other chemicals, and then eventually slaughtered in some horrific manner. It's also claimed in a lot of these documentaries that the poultry industry has a negative impact on the environment. But we'll be speaking with Tyler Dolly, who is not only an organic chicken farmer, but he also cares deeply about regenerative agriculture, animal welfare, and sustainability. Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate the intro. I feel pretty special and smart now. <laughs> so how do you become interested in sustainable agriculture and farming practices? Uh, I won the genetic lottery. That's what it came down to. I was actually this is this is the family ranch. We I was born and raised out here. Okay. And, and um, in the early '80s, when I was still very short, my dad had to change the course of the ranch that we were not big enough to succeed in a conventional manner. So he just started exploring stuff, and he ran across a guy named Alan Savory, who is a Depending on what world you live in, he is either a big celebrity or a minor celebrity, but he he is a Rhodesian philosopher, wildlife biologist who kind of figured out it's he's a cool guy. Look him up. He has a TED talk. It's had okay. multiple millions of views. And okay. his central thesis is that uh, is that animals should be moved just like the wildebeest in the Serengeti would move. They would be chased by wool or lions or whatever. And so my dad started doing this, but we don't have wool. Well, we do sort of have wolves now, but we used electric fence. That's how we control our animals grazing. So we would move our cattle at the time around on different pastures and be very aware of the regrowth of the plants and long fun story. But then that led us into taking care of our cows, changing the genetics of our cattle that grass really want the animal to be the right type of animal. And for us that meant a short wide cow, which so happens to finish well on grass, which means that we had good genetics for grass fed beef right around when I graduated college in 2000. So we started going to farmer's markets um, with our grass-fed beef. And that led us to some lamb, that led us to goat. And eventually through a long series of unfortunate events, <laughs> we uh, we ended up grow growing a lot of chicken. And now we are one of the probably top one, two, three producers of pasture poultry here in California. Cool. So what does sustainable agriculture mean? Right. So th this is this is a this is a new trend and people are to some degree defining it individually and they're coming up with their own answers for it. So I'll share you with share you my answers but just understand that there's no set definition. So what I say is regenerative or sustainable someone else might say oh that's complete bs he's wrong. Um but ultimately people who are in producers who are in this space of regenerative or sustainable what they're really paying attention to is the entire chain of our ecosystem that you can't just pull out one aspect of it and, and, and only care about that. So, you know, if, if I were a row cropper, I can't just grow corn or fertilizer on it and expect a good harvest. 
No, if I'm a sustainable rancher, I'm thinking about my mycorrhizal fungi, which are all the little fun things that grow in the soil. I'm worried about how much leaf cover I have, how much solar energy am I capturing? And then if I'm an animal guy, I'm starting to worry, not worry, I'm starting to think about, well, how am I going to use these animals to graze these plants? Plants were evolved to be grazed by animals. Animals were evolved to graze plants, but mother nature has her own process for doing this. And it's a great process, but it's a very hands-off process. And when we get in there with our conventional thinking, we muck it all up and we have degradation of our rangelands. So regeneration or sustainability is really to understand mother nature's process, which kind of is what I talked about the Serengeti and the wildebeest being chased around by lions that we want to take that sort of passive management that mother nature would use and then add our, our active management to it. So we don't want to rely on just wolves chasing away our, our coyotes or whatever. We have to actively move the cows and we're moving them for a very specific reason. We're paying attention to the grass and how it's regrowing the time of year. We're looking at our rain forecast and we're, we're playing with all these factors that mother nature can passively do. And she does it really well. But because it's passive, it's slow. So when we're doing it actively, we're getting in there and we're being, okay, this grass, this pasture has recovered pretty well. Time to put cows in. Uh, okay, we're done with our growing season. How much grass do we have until our next rainfall? Oh, we have too many cows or we have not enough cows. Let's change our animal herd size to fit what we actually grew and so the definition, my definition of regeneration is to pump as much life into our soil, the very foundation of all life on earth, if you ignore the oceans, of course, all life on earth, and then draw forth what life you can, and then just keep it growing and getting bigger and more, more synergistic that the fertility that used to exist in our landscape before European management processes came in is just, it's hard to imagine how fertile our landscape used to be. And we can get back to it in, you know, decades, not thousands of years. And we just need more and more people to be thinking about how to put life back into the soil. And is it's that like because... Interest. Is that because when we when we farm, we grow the same crops over and over again until all the minerals and other nutrients are sucked out of that soil? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, to some degree, think of your your soil as uh, as a bank of fertility of life, and that in over thousands of years that mother nature's put a lot of fertility in there and it kind of grows with a kind of a compounding interest. So if you come with your plow and you plow up, you know, 5,000, 10,000 years of fertility, you're going to have an amazing crop of corn and you'll probably have a pretty good crop of corn the next year and the next year. But what you're doing is you're, you're basically drawing money out of your, your, your stock portfolio. You're losing all of your compound interest and eventually right you got nothing left. So to some degree, it's kind of a tortured metaphor right now, but to some degree, it's the, the it's think of the soil, the fertility in your soil is a stock market. You want to be living on the interest of your principal, not living off the principal itself. So in our case, what the principal that a farmer is trying to put into his landscape is, is vitality, you know, and you do that through green leaves and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. Right. Um, and I, I guess it, it could even be a benefit to have multiple animals on the farm at one time. I remember, oh, yeah. I remember reading um, The Omnivore's Dilemma and Michael Pollan talks about how one animal would do one thing and another animal would do another thing. And Oh, it's 100% true. So one of the things that I'm kind of leaning t into here on the ranch is... I don't have a great term for it yet, but like a California meat case that when you go into your grocery store, you look at the meat case and it's going to look exactly like the meat case in New York state or Florida. You know, you're going to have a lot of beef, a lot of chicken, a medium amount of pork and no, no uh, lamb or goat. And it's the same everywhere. But then you, you step out of this mythical um, uh, grocery store and you're like, wait a second, it snows in New York city. 
in our part of California, it doesn't snow. I mean, just right there alone, why are we eating the exact same meat? <laughs> so getting back to mother nature and different species that here in our particular part of California, we're in a Mediterranean climate, which means we have cool, wet winters and hot, where, dry summers. Where are you guys located? Uh, we're in Red Bluff. So we're in the Sacramento Valley, a couple hours okay. north of a um, couple hours north of Sacramento. Okay. Four hours ish north of the Bay Area. Um, and so we have hot, dry summers, and there's a lot of really fascinating stuff about it that I won't bore you with. But if you want to know, just ask me because I will okay. I will tell you. <laughs> um, but what it comes down to is that um we have hills and we have brush out on our ranch. Hills and brush are not what cows want to eat, but they're exactly what goats and sheep want to eat. Okay. So ultimately. And so this is where it gets really exciting. You know, California, we've been burning, you know, five of the la of the biggest fires ever have been in the last five years. Right. Yeah. Well, what are they burning? That. They're burning brush. It's brush, right. short, shrubby stuff that's burning. Well, what can things it ha that ecosystem has been growing because through management, we have removed fire. I mean, that's a whole separate story, fire, controlled burns, but also we've re removed animals from that environment. There are no elk out there anymore grazing this stuff down. There's not big, huge herds of, of deer grazing this sort of forage down anymore. So it just grows up and the grow, the, the bigger and older it gets, the more flammable, flammable it becomes, then poof, it burns. Right. So what we're doing, so in California, because we're a Mediterranean climate that grows really good goat and sheep, uh, we should be eating goat and sheep because those goat and sheep are going to graze down our chaparral zone. That's a huge higher fire hazard. You're even, you're seeing this now, right? There's brushing crews. You see them all the time. It's really fun. Like people are bringing in 500 groats, goats to graze down the, the fuel load around their, their housing um, community or oh, cool. blackberries in the creeks. I mean, th there's, it's a booming community, a uh, booming industry. And so all I'm saying is what we're trying to do is take that idea of grazing with multiple species because different species eat different things. There is a specific set of species that we should have here on Big Bluff Ranch. And then so with the right species, we're taking care of our landscape. We're making it better. We're soaking in more rainfall. And then we're also creating really delicious, nutritious, wholesome food at the end of the day that takes care of us so we can take care of them and people just haven't had good goat and lamb. That's the only reason they don't eat it because it's delicious. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, tell us how the way you raise your chickens is different from the commercially raised chickens. <clears throat> and I'm right. sure most people have seen these videos where the chickens are crowded into these little tiny cages in horrible conditions. Right. Right. So I've definitely talked a lot about, you know, ruminants and grazing and um, haven't really talked about our chickens at all, but that's kind of what we specialize in right now. So you're exactly right that um, the conventional chickens live in barns. There's a very extremely controlled environment and those birds really never see the light of day. Their airflow is regulated. Their feed is regulated. Their water is regulated. The the square footage that they live in gets regulated. Um, and it's really designed to create cheap food and it does a really good job at that, but there's a lot more out there that should be done than just having cheap chicken. So, you know, I've talked a lot about taking care of the soil and taking care of the animals. And one aspect of taking care of animals is to allow those animals to be their natural selves. So, for instance, we don't feed our cows any sort of grain. Cows aren't really meant to eat grain. It actually messes up their gut. Chickens are not meant to be inside. It messes up all of their hormone system. They need the sun. They need vitamin D. They need to see the sun go down. They just need to see the sun come up. They need to eat grass. They need to eat bugs. So that's um, that's what we do. So our chickens are out on, a, out on pasture from day one. So that's... Um, they have no wall well, they have walls, but they have complete access to outside. They can run outside if they want to, they run inside if they want to. Um, we feed them a certified organic, locally grown, no corn, no soy ration. 
because that is a ration that California can grow well. And then, yeah, they're fertilizing the soil. The, the soil is growing grass. The gra- cat chickens are eating it. And then we harvest them from that spot, move them, move them on to the next spot. A new set of birds are on a new set of pasture. All that fertility that we left behind with the chicken manure, we let the, the plants and the soil microbes absorb it and lock it in and just keep that. <laughs> it's just, it's so fun when you get into it, because if you really just start, it just one thing gets better here. That means that thing gets better. If this is getting better then that's getting better. It's this huge ball of like, synergism it's fun so it's really fun can when it pretty works. much be raised on grass well is that what they eat or they, they get they get a lot of they get a lot of nutrition from grass but okay. chickens chickens are not vegetarians so okay. when you see vegetarian fed labels in the grocery store that's really not a a diet a chicken is meant to eat. They are, they are omnivores and they are very happy to eat meat and high protein. And you don't right. really get that out of your pasture. You know, okay. it's, it's a salad, right? So they need the protein portion of their, their big ass salad. Which is so what, bugs and, and bugs and stuff and like that. But ultimately we end up supplementing them with a no corn, no soy ration, um, just to make sure that they never hit any deficiencies from what our pasture would provide them. So I can't really give percentages, but they're definitely out there on the pasture and they're definitely eating some supplementation and it works out just fine. They're, they're very happy, very healthy birds. Right. And then, um, uh, how do you avoid giving antibiotics and some of the other chemicals that are given, uh, commercially raised chickens? Right. Well, let's see, <laughs> this is kind of a, another part of that synergism that I get now, all excited And are any antibiotics given partially because they make them fatter? Uh, the conventional house, they're phasing that out pretty aggressively now in the conventional industry, but until probably the last five to 10 years, yeah, that's what they would do. Sub-therapeutic levels of antibiotics to grow the chickens faster, which is where people, you're starting to hear about superbugs, right? That there are some Short antibiotic resistant bacteria. Yep. 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 And then then a lot of people are pointing out the problems with this subtherapeutic use of antibiotics for animal production. So the thing is, is that they need those antibiotics because they are stressed out, right? A stressed animal not living in kind of imagine yourself, right? If you are stressed, there's, you know, you, you, you're inside too much or whatever you, you can tell when you're worn out, you tend to get sick, right? You've depressed your immune system right. because you're not taking care of yourself. Well, just kind of imagine yourself like stuck in a football stadium with all those other people, but that's what you do for your entire life. You're going to have pretty high stress levels. You're probably going to need some antibiotics to, to kind of keep yourself going. So to take that uh, metaphor, take, get out of that football stadium. And once you have space around you, you know, you have the sun, you have fresh air, you can engage with your, your friends on the right level. Like you're kind of back to a normal, happy, healthy thirst person, and you're not going to get sick. That's the same thing with what we do with our chickens is that we provide the environment that they're not going to get sick in. You know, they get shade when they want it. They get shelter when they want it. They get the grass, they get the sun, they get all their friends. They have no pressure from predators because we have guard dogs out there with them. And, you know, if you're a ha- happy, well taken care of person, you don't get sick. It's the same thing for chickens. You give them the right environment and they're good to go. You don't need antibiotics. It's only when you kind of stress them that you have to go to the pharmacy, pharmacy to make your living. <laughs> Right. And how do you get around the fact that they use the antibiotics to make them grow faster? You just take longer for the chickens to mature? Yeah. And exactly. Well, and then, so that is, yes, we, our birds grow a little bit, grow out a little bit longer than conventional birds, um, which is really a good thing because not only does that mean we can kind of avoid antibiotics and any, any other stuff like that, the we raise a breed called Cornish Cross, which is the same genetics you're going to buy from the grocery store, um, and that they it's really kind of actually an amazing breeding. There's no genetic modification; it's just really strict, controlled breeding for decades. And they've gotten these birds to grow so fast that it's actually they've been bred where their muscles can grow faster than their organs, um, in an ideal ideal situation. 
So when uh, the industry has a term, they're called flippers that basically the heart can't pump enough blood around and they die of a heart attack and they flip right on their back. Um, and what we do, we don't have, we raise the exact same genetics, but we don't have any flipper deaths just doesn't happen. Um, and that's because our birds grow a little bit slower. So the organs develop on in relation to the muscle. And so they're just healthy, happy birds. So some people have uh, some issues with the Cornish cross and it's not unguided, but that you give them the right environment and they don't have issues. So now that's... Aren't, aren't there commercially grown uh, chickens where they say they're grass fed, but really all that means is they let them out of the cages for a short period of time and they go back in. Right. Yep. Yep. So that the, the term for that, at least in the chicken world would be free range, free range, chicken, free range, free range eggs. And that, that okay, is. So if a... we see that term free range, chicken, free range eggs, what does that mean? Um, hey, I'm just, <clears throat> Hey, George, I'm on the phone. I'll be right back out. Okay. Sorry about that. The kids just okay. got back from school. Um, yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Fine. Okay. So free range, free range is a legally defined term. It's kind of like organic. There are a set of, of guidelines and um, that you have to meet to qualify for free range. Um, and depending on if you're looking at meat birds or layers, they're a little bit different, but ultimately it comes down to, outdoor access is the term. And so what that means is you have just the same exact conventional barn. It's like a football field sized barn. Um, but instead of being completely enclosed, like most conventional barns, it will have these little pop out doors, um, leading out to a little tiny, um, patio area and different, different free range certifiers have different requirements for the free, uh, the outdoor square footage, but it's not very much. And the other thing is that chickens are creatures of habits. They, they do the same thing over and over and over again. You ever heard the saying, um, your chickens always come home, come home to roost, right? <laughs> That's a real thing. Chickens sleep in the exact same spot. They are creatures of habit. So by the time they get around to opening those doors and those free range barns, um, their habits are set and they just don't really go outside. So it sounds good. So if you talk to someone like me, I get this all the time. Like, oh, you're a pasture raised person or pasture raised poultry. You must be free range then. I'm like, well, yes, but we are so much more than free range because people's, the image in people's mind is free range, red barn, farmer and overalls, green grass, a few chickens here and there. That's what free range conveys in the term, but the actual practices are very, very far from that. If you want that image, you need to be looking for a pasture raised chicken. That's the only type of chicken that's going to be out there on, on grass, the majority of its life. So if it says pasture raised, that means it's got to be free to roam around. Um, it's pretty much its entire life till the end. Pretty much. Yeah. There are different. Yes. The answer is yes. If you see someone saying free or, or pasture raised, you're going to be very happy with that chicken. There are some different styles of how you do pasture raised chicken, but I don't want to split hairs. Go, go. If you see pasture raised, that's got the stamp of approval. And, um, you, we've heard reports about chickens being fed feed with arsenic in it. And what was that about? Is that still being done? Well, I don't know the exact arsenic story. At least I can't recall it off the top of my I, I'm head. I'm trying but... to remember. It was some sort of arsenic related chemical that had to do with, I think once again, it was to somehow they would grow faster or something. Yeah. I think it's a growth promotant that, that kind of rings a bell. So I don't know that specifically, okay. but I don't think it's been outlawed. So I don't, there's no... There's no reason that a producer, you know, a conventional guy couldn't be doing that. Okay. And, but I would just say that I don't, anyone who is taking care of animals, they are trying to do the best job they can, right? That the, 
you know, I don't, I'm not pointing fingers at conventional farmers at all. They're just doing the best they can with the the systems and knowledge that they have. And that, um, you know, one of the things I like to tell people is that you get to vote for the future. You get to vote every three times a day. You're voting with your food dollars. I'm sure I'm stealing that quote from, I know I'm stealing that quote from someone else. So I'm not that smart, but if you don't like how those chickens are raised or how those farmers are treated, just buy some different style chicken, buy an organic chicken. Is it as good as pasture raised? No, but it's a lot better than a conventional chicken. And you will eventually through your dollars and your food choices, create the food system that you want that these big companies are not evil. They're just profit driven. So signal to them with your dollars that, Hey, this is where I want to spend my money. And they'll, they'll turn as fast as they possibly can. And I, there's actually, I, a, yeah, there's I, a lot of examples of that happening. Okay. I eat purely organic is pretty much 90% at a time. But then I read these reports about how these big companies have gotten into organic and then they get the rules changed so they can add this and add that and it still qualify as organic. So, you know, that's, I, yeah, I, it's, I, I, my, my conclusion is, is organic is better than not organic, but you know, it'd be even better if, you know, they weren't allowed to get in and say, well, we can add this chemical. And because that chemical originally comes from sea seaweed, then it's okay. And this is okay. And yeah, I totally agree. I mean, there, that always happens when you have a third party auditor, third party certifier that all of a sudden you have standards and guidelines. And then all of a sudden that means that there becomes loopholes. It right. just kind of is, is a nature, nature of the beast. And, um, I, I totally agree with you that organic is better than not organic, but is organic as good as organic should be? No, no, but it's directionally right. More and more people are buying organic. Now you're starting to see kind of like that higher level of organic. Like there are actually regeneratively certified organic products out there. It's a standard we're looking into, which again, is that as good as what we do? Are we getting all the credit for what we do? Not necessarily, but again, it's another higher level and we can just keep moving the food system forward by voting with our dollars, taking, taking the best step you possibly can. You know, I think that's just really important. I mean, for us personally, when you buy a chicken from us, like you're keeping us in business and all the things that we're doing for our landscape, it's a very one-to-one -one exchange. Like, Oh, you bought a chicken. Yay. I can go buy food now or whatever, you know? Um, but, so it's a very, your dollars matter. I realize when you go to the grocery store, you're like, eh, so what? But it, it actually is, it's, it's a very powerful thing. And, you know, if you buy straight from a farmer, like from us or from another farmer, local farmer, like it's dramatic. You're like, wow, I, you are literally keeping people in business. So just to kind of give you that right. sense of like empowerment, like right. you are really, really important. We right. love you. <laughs> cool. So, um, what what about the way your chickens are um, slaughtered and what ha what are the conditions um, and and then how are the chickens treated after they're they're killed? Um, we've heard reports about chickens being bleached and put in all kinds of chemicals and uh, and the processes that are used to end their lives or you know. Tor torturous and, and, you know, horrific. Right. Right. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a chicken conventional chicken houses process something like 5,000 birds an hour. It's, it's insane how fast they do. And when you're going that fast, you know, things kind of, Corners have to be cut, not corners have to be cut. You just can't do everything right. Right. When like they're literally going so fast, you can't count them. It looks like a ch -ch 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 -ch. it's really, really fast. Um, so we don't go to a, a processing plant like that. We go to a small um, processing plant, uh, not too far away from us. Um, all of the slaughtering is done by hand, which means that mistakes don't get mistakes don't happen because it's done by hand there. Every single bird is hand slaughtered um and 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 are the birds uh, slaughtered pretty quickly after they go there oh yeah yeah okay. yeah so we'll, for us in particular we catch our birds after the sun goes down so 
chickens fall asleep hard, man. You know, if it's like waking up a teenager, like it doesn't happen. Like, uh, and then we get them there before <laughs> dawn. And then, so basically they go to sleep and then they never wake up. So for Crazy. us, we have a really great way of getting this done and our processing plant, they go into a room, uh, they hold them in a right a room with blue lights so they don't wake up. And they go into the kill room, which has red light, so they don't see all of the blood if they might even look around. And then they go and get plucked and gutted. And it's all done by hand, which is much cleaner and safer than these big automatic machines. It means our processing costs are a lot higher, but it's a lot better of a product. And the real thing that um, we are super fortunate to have is that you were kind of talking about the chlorine bass. So in many, many, many chicken oper- or processing operations, the way they chill the birds down, because you need to take that, that normal body temperature and get it down to a food safe 40 degrees pretty rapidly. I think you have four hours to do it. The most cost efficient way of doing that is to put it in water. You have a really good thermodynamic exchange. It, it draws down the temperature really quickly. Well, but as soon as you start doing that, you're putting 5,000 birds an hour into the same puddle of water. Like if one bird is sick, all the other birds are going to have that salmonella right. or whatever. Right. So the way they the way they get away or to stop that, to mitigate that risk is they chlorinate the heck out of that water. So one of the things that happens is while they're in this heavily chlorinated water to keep them from cross-contaminating each other, as the meat cools down, it actually absorbs in this chlorinated water. So if you look on some chicken packages, you'll, you will see a little asterisk that talks about like added water. That's the added water that they're talking about, the I chlorinated see. cooling water. I so see. we don't do that. Our, our processor doesn't do that. They do something called air chilling, which is much better. So basically it's hang a chicken and it goes into a big old freezer and comes down to tap. So it never touches anyone else. It never touches water. So to some degree, it's like dry aging of beef that you're actually pulling moisture out. Water is wonderful, but it doesn't have any flavor. So you take the water out and you concentrate the flavor of the bird itself. Plus you're not cost contamination. You're not extra weight of water. And it's, it's an amazingly delicious way of processing your chicken. And then they come out of the chill chamber, hand packaged flash frozen, and then off to, uh, off to someone to eat it. Cool. Do you have some reports from people telling you how much healthier they have, they feel, or even reports of health conditions improving from eating your quality chickens? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the best things about being a direct to consumer type operation that we, if you order chicken from us, you will probably talk to me either on the phone or on email and I will be shipping it to you. Like I'm not like some (laughs) corporate mucky muck and I have flunkies below me. I'd like to have flunkies, but I don't, it's me. (laughs) You'll be buying from me. And so um, we'll talk and it'll be a lot of fun. And yeah, I get feedback all the time. You know, my my current favorite compliment is uh, tastes like grandma's chicken, (laughs) right? Cause you know, chicken, chicken right now, the, the joke is it tastes like chicken means it tastes like nothing. It's bland. Well, the reality is, is the reason chicken tastes bland now is because it's fed corn, it's fed soy, and then it's literally watered down. Of course, it's going to be bland. It's uh, So our bird, and they have no exercise. Our birds are outside in the sun. Their hormones are working right. They're getting some exercise. Um, and then they're treated really well through the processing, processing process. And so, yeah. I mean, we raise grandma's chickens. So if you, if you want to impress anyone with like, Hey, this is how my grandma used to cut chicken. Her recipe is really good. Don't get me wrong. But the real star ingredient was the fact that she had it in her backyard. So if you want that style chicken, you look, look for us or look for someone else doing pasture raised chicken. Right. Cool. So, um, I think that's the questions that, that I have anything else you want to tell us about? Oh, well, I mean, we only have what another two hours now. I'm just joking. No, <laughs> no I, we've covered a lot of stuff. I really appreciate the time. No, I mean, I mean anyone... we, we're, we're fine with time. If there's anything else you wanted to tell us about, you know, what you're doing. Uh, no, no, I, I, okay. I, I think, okay, good. I think, 
think that feels pretty good. I mean, I can, yeah. if you have any more questions, I've, I've got time. I don't need to cut off, but uh, yeah. yeah, we can start wrapping it up if you'd like. Yeah. That's, that sounds good. Um, yeah, I don't really have any other questions prepared. Um, so how can, um, if people listening or watching this podcast, find out about ordering some chickens from you? Right. Uh, it's pretty simple. Big bluff Um, there'll be a big old shop now button and, uh, yeah. Order some chicken, shoot me an email. If you want to ask any questions or want some more information, and so you know, uh, does the chicken come frozen? Uh, yep. Frozen. It's frozen. Yeah. So it, it, it'll be shipped frozen. It'll be on, uh, in, in, well, right now it'll be in an insulated cooler. We hope to get a better packaging, but right now it's a styrofoam cooler, um, dry ice or uh, gel ice, and we'll ship it FedEx and it just shows up right at your door. We'll have um, okay. tracking numbers on it so you can make sure, you know, that <laughs> it is where it's supposed to be. And, uh, yeah, no, it works out great shipping, especially in the winter shipping is no problem. Right. Okay, cool. Um, uh, big bluff ranch, Tyler Dolly. Thank you for your time. And, um, uh, look forward to, uh, talking to you again in the future. And thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the rational wellness podcast. And for those of you who enjoy listening to the rational wellness podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will be able to discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to say thank you to all the patients that we've been working with at our White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic, who many of whom, most of whom we've been able to help with a range of various health conditions from various types of gut disorders to um, thyroid and hormonal issues, autoimmune diseases, and, and, and various other uh, cardiometabolic conditions. Um, and so I, I uh, uh, very much appreciate you and I'm excited about going forward, helping you to, um, to uh, improve your health on your journey towards optimal health. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have a few openings now for new clients and you can take advantage of that by calling my white sports chiropractic and nutrition, Santa Monica office at 310-395-3111. And we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine, nutrition, um, and we can get that going um, as early as the new year. So give us a call and I'll talk to you next week.